Taggart Van Etten, welcome to the podcast, buddy. How are you? Hey, Dylan. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm great. I'm glad that uh, we're finally sitting down for this conversation. I, I figured that uh, eventually I would get around to uh, sending you a, a DM on, on social <laughs> media and invite you on the show. And you posted something that ended up connecting us that I thought was, uh, it was really hilarious. I had never had this type of a post lead to a guest coming on the podcast, but just for our listeners, you posted something last week that said, this is the first and last time I will ever tweet something like this. If there is a podcast that would like to have me on and to talk about my two DNFs and how I'm approaching training differently and my race schedule this fall, DM me. I am available this week only. And I loved it, man. And of course, a couple of people sort of <laughs> tagged me into the conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we just sort of talked about before we press record here, you know, I've been following you on Twitter. I love your attitude. I love your voice. And uh, so it's great to, to have you on the podcast. And we'll get around to these last two DNFs and what you learned and your career in general. But let's start by uh, just talking a little bit about your background. Introduce us to Taggart. Obviously, your newer name on the scene, but you're no stranger to pain, suffering, and endurance. So, so tell us a little bit about your background with sport, where you live, where you grew up, things like that. So um, I'm from central Illinois, a very small farming community. Um, I would say my probably my endurance background started in my college triathlon days. Uh, previously before that, I was a collegiate runner, and I just had some bad coaching and some bad, uh, some bad training on my part that uh, led me into some swimming and cycling to cross train. Go ahead. And I had a decent <laughs> career uh, 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 doing uh, a collegiate triathlon. But then after I graduated college and kind of got into the more um, what I would call uh, upper end age group uh, uh, triathlete type stuff, I was finding a lot of success. Um, I was bringing my half Ironman, uh, a personal best time down pretty much every single race. I was racing once a month. It was like the coolest summer of my life. Just like you, you, uh, you basically train for three or four weeks, you taper for a week and then you race and you train again for three or four weeks, you taper and you race. It was just, it was just a blast doing that. Um, I didn't really grow up swimming. I took up swimming in college and I tried to become the best swimmer I could. Um, there was times in my uh, triathlon training when I was swimming up to 35,000 yards a week. That's about 25 miles, I think. So, wow. yeah. Yeah. And for those, for those who are listening, I, I actually follow triathlon very closely as well. But when you don't grow up a swimmer, it's a huge disadvantage mm -hmm. when you're trying to compete at like a professional level. So, um, yeah, so, it's, it's, so talk a little bit more about the triathlon thing, because it is some, a sport that I pay attention to a lot. Do you still follow the sport and how do you oh, yeah. set you up for success uh, so far early in your ultra career? So um, I would definitely say my 70.3 training like showed me how to train at an elite and a high consistent level because I knew that um, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I had to be in the pool getting in 2,200 yards worth of work. I knew that every Tuesday and Saturday I'd be running intervals. And I knew that on Thursdays and Sundays, I had to be cycling hard. Um, I, it, it taught me just how to kind of set up training, how to consistently every day uh, you show up for your sport and you get your job done that day. Yeah. And it's so complex too, mm -hmm. from a training perspective and it's so diverse and dynamic and it takes up so much freaking time. Do you think, I mean, obviously we'll probably get to this more a little bit later, but you're a pretty maximal volume trainer <laughs> now as a runner. Uh, so does it seem as if you took all the time that you spent swimming and biking and translated it all into your running now? So I would say I'm saving a little bit of time because uh, the logistics of like driving to the pool going into the gym, changing, getting into the pool, doing the workout, and then just coming back home. It, it takes, a, it, it does take a lot of time. Um, you know, in college, in college, that wasn't that big of a deal because you have all day to do nothing. But then um, once I kind of got into the early parts of my career and kind of kind of like that post-college, right before I became, quote, a real adult, um, I could definitely tell that it was very time consuming. Yeah. And do you still incorporate multi-sport stuff into your training at all? Are you ever hitting the trainer or going on rides or? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, um, I go I go on Zwift. Uh, this off season, I was racing on Zwift. Um, when I take time off from running, I'm riding my bike. Um, I was actually supposed to do an Ironman this coming weekend, um, but I decided after the sub eleven, the Ironman was supposed to be what I call dessert yes. on top of on top of the sub eleven, and I felt like I didn't deserve the dessert, which I was going to train for triathlon all summer. <laughs> So um, hopefully next summer I can, I can get back into an Ironman. That's Dude, kind of the plan at some point. I get the sense that you're really hard on yourself just from <laughs> your, your social media posts. And I think we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. But For sure. Yeah, we should, we should get you and Walmsley to face off on Zwift and uh, see, uh, see who comes out on top because, you know, he sort of pursued triathlon at least um, with a moderate level of seriousness mm-hmm post-collegiately as well were you kind of on like the professional triathlon track um I was on track to get my my elite card I assume I would if I would have kept going I would have gotten it 2020 and then this past year probably gone into the elite category um the end of 2019 I was 23 and my 70.3 personal best was like a 411 or 412 I think I brought it down to that's super quick I mean, I mean, I mean, nowadays, you know, guys are going a lot faster because that was two years ago, just because of bike technology and people are training a little better now. I mean, I mean, that's kind of unbelievable just to see the difference of how super shoes and just like bike technology and swim technology has came in two years. But um, yeah, eventually I probably would have tried to go quote pro and triathlon, but didn't I guess it wasn't in the cards for me. You found your true calling, man, with tr- with uh, with ultra running, and uh, yeah, I did. You've had a lot of success, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. But you know, I'm kind of interested to stick on this uh, triathlon cool. subject and mm-hmm. your background and stuff. I mean, you just said that you'd still follow the sport uh, at least mm-hmm. somewhat closely as you've gotten into trail running and started to learn a little bit more about kind of the professional side of the sport. Is there anything kind of from the professional side of triathlon that you think ultra could, could borrow from, or are there any particular athletes there that you find inspiring or that you sort of model your own career off of? And if so, sort of who are those people and, and what makes you uh, attracted to them? So uh, for triathlon, kind of the one guy that I look up to that pretty much everyone looks up to is Jan Ferdano. I mean, he is, he is God. just, stud world-class like uh um uh, uh he's got the mercedes sponsorship he's got the canyon sponsorship i mean he's like 39 and he just went well like 735 a month ago or something like that or oh against something. the in the head-to-head with lionel yeah yeah that was so cool yeah um yeah um jan is just on a different level i just i just can't believe that guy yeah. he's just insane dude you're kind of like the lionel sanders of ultra running <laughs> Sort of like, really? I, I mean, you, you sort of have that sort of like workhorse mentality, you know, just like that big volume the mm-hmm. you know, get it done. No excuses. Nobody cares, you know, mm-hmm. that you're working hard, um, you know, kind of blue collar work ethic. So yeah, you should, well, thank you. you should wear that as a badge of honor. Yeah. Thank you. And thank I'm you. Sure I appreciate that. 75% of people who are listening to this right now have no idea who Lionel Sanders is, but <laughs> look him up. Yeah. Pro triathlete. You know, you know, um, you know, I got a funny story about Lionel Sanders. Um, I was, this was right after college. I was laying in bed one night and he came out with a YouTube video around like nine 30 and it excited me up so much that I went to my bike, signed up on for an hour race on Zwift and at around 11 o'clock. And then I had to wake up like the next morning at six o'clock and go for a, a run or a swim. Like <laughs> that's how much he amped me up that night. I was like, I just need to get on the trainer right now because he's working hard. So, so I guess I need to right now. <laughs> yeah. Dude is a beast. I should try and get him on the podcast too. Cause he's got a great personal story too. Anyway, oh, you should. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's move off a triathlon and talk a little bit more about running. Um, obviously like you're relatively new to the scene and actually probably a lot of the people who are going to listen to this episode, your name might be totally new to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've covered your background a little bit. Um, but you know, just for context, you've been in the sport now for what, just a little over a year coming up on two years basically, but 12 months of that was in the middle of the COVID pandemic. So you're still Mm -hmm. very much a new character on the scene, but you got crazy talent. You got such a bright future ahead. And your, your hundred mile debut is when you first came on my radar, when you ran 
Tunnel Hill, but sort of before we get to that, that was your first ultra marathon. It was 100 miles. And obviously, most people who come to the sport take a progressive approach, right? They go 50, yeah. 50 mile, 100K, 100 mile, or something to that effect. They don't go straight from collegiate triathlon straight to 100 miles. So what motivated you to jump into the deep end like that? And, and what motivated you to, to choose Tunnel Hill in particular? So, um, you know, because of the pandemic, I had um, aspirations to run a marathon. Um, that, that, that is kind of the reason why I left triathlon was because I wanted to build to a marathon OTQ. And there wasn't any marathons, any majors going on in 2020. So I just built mileage and sooner, sooner I was running 120 miles a week and then 150 and 160 and 170. And um, I had been doing what I call my own time trial ultra marathons pretty much once a month. I mean, I, I mean, I, I knew where I was in shape uh, before Tunnel Hill and I was figuring stuff out basically every weekend. You know, I was running anywhere between 30 to 50 miles. So um, a lot of people think that uh, that I didn't really have much experience going into Tunnel Hill, but um, I did. You know, I, I uh, just I just from the nutrition of triathlon, then I brought that into ultra running it. And just like I said, my long runs every weekend were getting to be a ridiculous length. So all the ups and downs that people experience in races, I was experiencing in, in the in the months leading into Tunnel Hill. Yeah, yeah, I mean it's it's so funny to to say it like that because yeah, on paper you had no experience mm -hmm. in terms of ultra marathon racing, but the volume you're putting in is just stupefying, bro. Like <laughs> when you're when you're putting in 150, 170, 200 mile weeks. I mean, obviously you're only what, 25 years old right now. So mm -hmm. life is, life is simple. Um, it is. It's very easy. You're, you're a teacher. So, I mean, talk a little bit about the preparation for tunnel Hill in particular and like, how, how did it come on? How did it come on your radar? And I mean, did you go into it with the confidence that you could run as fast as you did? And I guess we haven't really mentioned how fast you ultimately ran. So, so um, you know, sort of weave that into the, into the answer yeah so um leading into it uh basically every morning uh from august until the race in november i was running about 16 17 miles before before work and school then i'd come home and run around eight or nine miles uh saturdays would be like i said that 30 to 50 so mile how early how early do you have to get up to squeeze in those miles before school most days i wake up a little before four right at four o'clock so I, I'm, I'm normally up by then, then running a little before five o'clock and I end around seven. Yeah. Discipline, bro. Anyway, I cut hey. you off. So, so oh, you're go, fine. Back to, go back to the race itself. Uh, yeah. What, so you put it on your radar and what were your goals? So uh, Tunnel Hill, uh, um, it's only about four hours south of my house. So it just kind of made sense that uh, this hundred mile was within driving distance and I could just take one day off work. And then just come back to school on Monday, just go do this big race on Saturday. Uh, I got a hold of Steve Durbin, the race director, because um, it was sold out. And because of COVID, they only allowed so many racers in the race. So uh, so basically, I had to send an email to Steve explaining my training, who I was. I didn't have any results, but I wanted to go after his course record. And he finally let me in. And it was, it was amazing that he did. Um, so the uh, course record at Tunnel Hill, it's 12.08 and some change. It's technically... Um, quote Zach Bitter's um trail 100 mile record or something like that it's 12 hours eight minutes and some odd seconds something like that and I told him that I thought I could lower it and he let me in so on um uh, November 14th of 2020 I set off to go under 1208 uh, yeah. that was the plan so talk about that because obviously like you put in a lot of work but you know zach bitter is somewhat of a legend he's been one of the best runners in the sport over the last you know decade or so and he's kind of a specialist in this arena the sort of fatter flatter faster courses and so he had the course record there at tunnel hill which again you said is technically a trail race but runs more like a road race soft surface, oh, yeah. but but yeah. flat and fast mm -hmm it sounds like that you sort of like have this self-confidence about you. And it's something that I always like to kind of explore on the podcast. And especially with people like you who have that discipline and that work ethic where you just put in monster volume. Do you get the, the self-confidence from the work that you put in or is it something that comes naturally to you? 
Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, I would, I wouldn't have like gone for that time if I wouldn't have put in 170 to 200 mile weeks, you know, the month leading into it. I mean, I was doing, I mean, I, I was 24 at the time. I was not going out, hanging out with my buddies at bars on Saturday nights. Cause I was waking up early on Sundays to run. Um, I was not uh, trying to go hang out with girls on Friday nights. You know, I was so just, just disciplined to try to get this 1208 that I, I just had to put a chip on my shoulder and say, you're going to, you're going to do everything you can to get to this, uh, uh, basically to this time on November 14th. And it was just the training. It was just the training, the build. I had a really good time trial um, in the middle of September that told me that it would translate well into a 1208. And um, yeah, it was just a combination of everything and just uh, bringing that nutrition from triathlon over into ultra. Um, I wasn't, a, I wasn't a 218 marathoner coming and who had never taken a gel in his entire life. You know, I, I had been racing half Ironmans for two years on that point. So um, I understood uh, kind of the fourth discipline and, and that. So that's uh, definitely gave me the confidence. Yeah. So ultimately you run 1219. So I guess you missed Zach Bitter's course record by 10 or 11 minutes. Was mm -hmm. it a disappointment to you or were you, did you surprise yourself? Because obviously like you shouldn't be disappointed by it. It's probably oh. the fastest hundred mile debut in, mm -hmm. in history. Probably one of the faster hundred miles ever run, or at least in the last decade or so. Um, what, what were your feelings after that race? Did it validate the fact that you had some talent and in, in ultra and did it motivate you to want to move in this direction rather than back towards marathoning or triathlon? I got through the finish line and like my hands were just beating on my chest. I, I kind of felt like I was Superman, honestly. Like it was, it was just an unbelievable feeling. Um, I think like the third thing I said afterwards was I was going to come back at the course record next year. I was, I was just so toasted uh, physically. I could hardly walk. I, I couldn't stand up like two days afterward, but um, I was just like, this is, this is what I was uh, meant to do all this time. It wasn't, uh, wasn't to be a fast 10 K runner. It wasn't meant to be a triathlete. It was meant to run 100 miles. And that's what that day, like just told me. I love it, man. I love, <laughs> lo love your attitude. And yeah, like I said, as a relatively new, new follower of yours, I think the, the voice that you bring to the sport and the, yeah, just, I don't know, the discipline, the work ethic, the sort of like humble, hard work comes through in your posts. And it has, you do have sort of like that, that chip on your shoulder and the, the self-belief and the willingness to work towards it. And I think it'll uh, only lead to, lead to positive things in your future. And of course, you know, you've done like in addition to Tunnel Hill, you got the world record uh, for a hundred miles on a treadmill. And then you had a couple of slip ups or a, a sort of a step backward after two mm -hmm. incredible um, things to start your career with. And we'll get to all that stuff. Um, but definitely want to sort of spend some time on the, the treadmill world record too, because this was kind sure. of like the next thing that you did after tunnel Hill. And it was another one of those things where it was like a huge exclamation point. Like here's Taggart. Like he is uh, a force to be reckoned with on the scene. How did that come on your radar? Because I'm assuming it was kind of like a, a, you know, capitalizing on what you could do during COVID when there weren't a lot mm -hmm. of races going on, but like what gave you the ambition to want to run a hundred miles on a treadmill? So um, originally I was going to go to Mad City and run the U.S. 100K National Championship. And that was, uh, but that got moved back because of COVID. And I couldn't fly out to do the U.S. 100 mile championship in Las Vegas, the one that Zach, Patrick, and a few others did. Uh, I just couldn't swing it with work and everything. Um, so in January, I was kind of weighing my options. And one of my buddies suggested that I make, uh, that I go after the treadmill world record. And then we kind of start planning it as like an event. So uh, there's this really nice bar and a restaurant pub in town called Seasons. And I approached the owner and said, hey, can I host this world record attempt at your bar? And he said, heck yeah, you can. <laughs> and oh. then... Uh, and then the uh, gold gym in town uh, gave me their, uh, gave me two of their treadmills and said, here, you know, you can use these. And so then finally we set a date that May 1st on May Day that I would 
go after the treadmill world record. And um, we had a sign up seat, uh, a sign up sheet where people would come run next to me. And I didn't run a single mile by myself, except for the last one. Mm. It was so the, it was a crazy day. So that the two treadmills were were side by side and you had yes. sort of someone almost acting as a pacer while you were it, yeah, while you were running in place. That's hilarious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, it was great. So I, I'm curious about this too. You know, I want to talk a little bit more about that effort itself because it was ridiculous. You smashed the world record. Um, but I'm just like, you're painting the picture of, you know, the local bar in town and the gold gym. <laughs> and I don't think we've spent much time on it. You say you're from central Illinois. Where exactly do you live? Like, what's your hometown like? And uh, um, yeah, like, how does that factor into the athlete that you are and the person that you are? I'm from Manitou, Illinois. Uh, it's a very small farming community, about a thousand people. Now I live in Morton, Illinois. It's a, it's a community of about 13,000. Um, it's, it's on the smaller side still, it still has that small town feel. Um, I grew up in the cornfield, it's dead flat. The, uh, the uh, humidity and heat here in the summer is awful. Um, um, I tell people that uh, I don't need to go train at altitude because I can run through the cornfields all summer and just roast at 120 degrees. Uh, yeah, I've just kind of grown up in that whole uh, just flat area. I mean, there there aren't very many trails, aren't very many hills around me. It's just it's just open road around here. So, how do you think that's influenced the type of person you are? I mean, obviously the the cornfield uh, <laughs> work ethic is is a thing. It's in itself. You know, I, I'm just sort of making that connection between these midwestern blue collar farming communities and oftentimes like industrial towns. My parents are from Illinois as well. My dad grew up okay. in Rockford, which is, oh, okay. as you know, I'm, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's fallen on hard times recently, mm -hmm. but a big industrial city in Illinois. And uh, yeah. How do you think just kind of growing up where you did has influenced the, the athlete that you are and the person you are and the, the work ethic that you have? You know, I can tell you about a job I did when I was 11 years old to 14 years old. I did, uh, I did what's called the tasseling. That's where you walk into wet corn and you pull the flower off the top of the stock. And you do that from sunrise to sunset. And if that doesn't harden you and make you think that just running is easy, then I don't know what will. Because doing that in like uh, middle school and just as a young kid, it just, it, it, it it just makes you tough. I, I, I don't know any way else to say that, but yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, the MMA fighters who like train in rural Idaho <laughs> and that's like all they do is just, yeah. You know, it's, it's easy to focus and it's easy to, mm -hmm. you know, when, when you are born and grow up among people that, that work hard from sunrise to sunset, it's not so hard to get up at four in the morning and put in 16 miles before you go teach all day. Huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, uh, before I've told people that uh, instead of going and running in Boulder in the summer where it's at elevation, they need to come to Illinois and run through the cornfields with me because it's tougher <laughs> yeah. with uh, with the 15 mile with the 50 mile power winds in the in the 80 degrees and uh, the 80 degree Fahrenheit with the 80 degree uh, with the 80 percent humidity, the 80 80, we call it. Yeah. it. It's not easy. It's not fun either, but it gets the not job. Easy. Okay, back to the treadmill world record. I mean, you ran 11.32, an absolutely astonishing time. The existing record was held by Zach Bitter and you managed to shave more than a half hour off of that record. Tell me about like your approach to the pacing uh, of the treadmill attempt. I mean, Zach is obviously an athlete that you have to respect. What time did you think that you could run? What time did you think was achievable? And uh, yeah, how did you go about sort of um, taking off so much time off the existing record? Um, I had a 100K and a 75 mile time trial leading into that. I had a 100K time trial at the end of January on the treadmill, then uh, 75, probably seven or eight weeks out. Uh, and I ran that 75 miles in 840 and I negative split the last 25 miles of the day. So um, I knew I was in pretty good shape going into the 100 mile one. I just had to put the icing on top of the cake of the training. Um, I knew that I could run um, anything from 1139 down. Uh, so uh, so I kind of the plan was to run 1139 because I was gonna try to get the overall world record six weeks later. Um, kind of, you know, I'm, 
very grateful I got the treadmill world record. I'm happy I ran 11.32, but I can tell you on that day, I was in 11.14, 11.15 shape. Um, I did not leave my whole race out there on the treadmill simply because I had the dome six weeks later. Uh, if I would have known what would have happened at the dome, I would have, I probably would have done something else, but, um, I don't, I, I don't, uh, regret not, I don't regret not go, going after the treadmill world record and then trying to do the dome. But, um, on that day I was in overall world record shape too. It was just kind of like the tune up for the bigger day yeah. six weeks later. I was going to say that that's an overall world record that you would have tried to run mm -hmm. on the treadmill. Mm -hmm. then. Wow. Mm -hmm. Incredible. So I guess back to the training, that's an interesting method that you take then with a hundred K time trial in January. And then you did a 75 mile run on the treadmill in training prior to the hundred mile attempt. Do you have guidance in your training or is this all stuff that you're kind of designing yourself and maybe what's the strategy in doing two such big efforts leading into the hundred miler? Uh, this is stuff that I've kind of written for myself, uh, for my own training. I've been my own coach this whole time, even through my triathlon days, I was self-coached. Uh, as far as the two, the uh, two time trials, 100K and the 75 miler, um, it was just something I knew I had to get in uh, a C and a B race before the A race. That's just kind of how stuff works out. You know, um, you try to race at least once before. And um, because of the huge mileage that my body can handle, and I'm very lucky and grateful my body can handle the big mileage, um, a 60 mile run and 75 70 mile run doesn't put the same stress on my body as it does most people. I mean, it's still very tough on me to do those efforts. It's still very hard to do but um, I'm able to recover quicker than most people. And that's how I knew that if I put them space, I think I had eight weeks in between the two of them and then either seven or eight weeks after the 75 before or my actual world record that I would have enough time to recover, build fitness and then taper again. So how do you manage that type of volume in your training also? are you somebody who is doing mostly low intensity volume or do you build in some harder efforts and intervals when you're building up to something like the treadmill hundred, hundred mile? So uh, the treadmill hundred miles, a little different than what my training is now. Uh, then I was doing a lot of just easy aerobic mileage, uh, you know, Monday through Friday, like I said, that 16 and eight, 17 and eight, uh, something like that would be, around like a seven and a half to seven minute pace. So about 120, 130 beats per minute for me for uh, three hours a day. Uh, just very easy aerobically. It's still tough on your body, on your, uh, on your neuromuscular system. But um, I incorporate a lot of treadmill running. When I'm outside on the roads, I wear a maximalist shoe. Uh, yeah, I just try to keep it as safe as possible. So you do the maximalist shoe specifically so that you can recover a bit quicker or it doesn't yeah. take as much oh, as yeah. your legs? Huh. Yeah. And then uh, Saturday would be my workout day. Um, so for the treadmill world record, my best workout, this wasn't even a time trial leading into it. I ran 100K at a 640 pace. I forgot what the time was, but um, I, was running these, I was running these 50 mile runs in five and a half hours every Saturday. Pretty much every Saturday morning, I'd wake up and try to run 50 pretty quick. And then Sunday, I would wake up and follow it up with a 26, to like a 32 mile run under a seven minute pace. And then I would spend Monday through Friday recovering from the whole weekend, just running very easy miles. And then by the time Saturday came around again, hit it hard Saturday and come back Sunday. And that, that was pretty much the routine. It's interesting because usually people do the Saturday, Sunday thing a little bit differently where you do the, the longer, lower intensity run on Saturday and the shorter, higher intensity run on Sunday, even though Sunday you're still doing more than a marathon and mm -hmm what seven seven minute pace i think you said is there any strategy in that because you know off in my training i'm always doing sort of the medium long run with some intensity on saturday followed by the long slow distance run on sunday what's uh what's the thought behind doing it in the opposite way so so kind of my training in tunnel hill i was doing less miles but i was shooting for a sub three hour marathon every sunday and that was going into tunnel hill so that was like a 652 pace or something but um, I felt like I had enough speed in my legs, but I was lacking endurance after Tunnel Hill. 
So that's why I increased the second day. And I figured, you know, in a 100 miler, I learned at Tunnel Hill that you have to learn to run medium, uh, kind of like a medium speed, you know, you still have to run fast on tired legs. So if I'm able to come back on Sunday and run for four hours at a seven minute pace after the day before, then it shows me that, Hey, I can handle, I can handle the fatigue. Well, mm -hmm. awesome. So, you know, we've touched on the two huge, uh, victorious accomplishments that you started your career career with tunnel hill running 12 19 fastest 100 mile debut ever then followed it up with an 11 32 treadmill world record in your first two you know quote unquote ultra marathons obviously one of them was just a personal time trial but mm -hmm. you managed to squeeze a world record out of it that's two it's a great way to start your career and like i said you really sort of like put your stamp on the sport, announced to the world like, hey, Taggart Van Etten's here. Um, and then based on those first two performances, obviously you're carrying a, a little bit more self-confidence, which is something that I mm -hmm. think comes naturally to you anyway. And you set your sights on six days in the dome where your goal was to break the overall 100 mile world, world record at the same race that Zach Bitter had previously set it, I think just the year before. Talk a little bit about your psychology leading into that. And do you think you were a little bit overconfident based on the hot start that you had in your career? And uh, yeah, sort of what, what was your, your strategy behind the 1059? 1059 or bust was your tagline for this, which would have lowered the existing world record by 20 minutes. So talk about your psychology going into that race. So, um... After the treadmill world record, I took one day off and then I started training again. I was, I probably my regret from that was I didn't enjoy it enough. I was just so focused on the dome that I knew, I knew going in the treadmill world record, I was going to go after the sub 11 at the dome. Um, I took a kind of, I took one day off all by a down week and then I got right back into hard training. I mean, I mean, the fire in me after the treadmill world record was even hotter than 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 what it was before i was just i was waking up naturally at like 3 30 in the morning just just to, just so excited to train before school and everything dude i love this about you too because <laughs> I, I mean you've tweeted at least once into my timeline something to the effect of i can't wait to wake up and run tomorrow like you can feel that fire that you have in you so and also we should re-emphasize the fact that that's this six days in the dome the 100 mile world record is only six weeks after the treadmill world record uh so we just i just want to make sure that that is uh yeah repeated because uh, the timeline i think is important to the story so uh finally i am getting close to my taper i'm putting in uh i think i had five weeks of like 230 plus of my highest week being 260 miles and in that 260 mile week I ran a, I ran a 60 mile long run at 623 paces, six hours, 23 minutes for 60 miles. And then at that point I thought I'm going to go, I'm going to go slaughter this, this 100 mile world record. You know, I, it was just, it was just insane. Once I got done with that run that day, I, I felt more confident after that day than I did after the treadmill run. I just, it just felt so great. Dude, I have never heard of anybody running a 260 mile week. Except, yeah. for, except for Timothy Olson when he's on the PCT running 50 miles a day. I mean, that, is, that is like crazy levels of, of volume. Mm -hmm. Like, do you ever get worried that you're overdoing it? Or do you have sort of like a, a, a personality that uh, steers away from moderation and, and towards excess? I think that's probably it. Um, you know, I, 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 I've kind of said this before. I don't care how long my ultra running career lasts. I'm here to break world records right now. I'm in a position right now where if I can get the 100 mile world record and potentially a few others and my legs bust in two years, then I have a couple world records and that's it. I mean, I, I, I don't see anything wrong with that. That's just, that's just kind of my like outlook over things. Um, yeah. Dude, that's that's interesting. We should talk about that a little bit more because this also, I don't know how familiar you are with sort of the recent history of ultra running because you're so new to it, but this is the exact same, I think, disposition, 
that and motivation that Jim Walmsley had when he came into the sport, where it was like, you know, it's all about leaving an exclamation point on the sport to smash as many course records as possible, to put as many trophies on the shelf and to squeeze as much potential out of his body as he could in, you know, a few years. And if it totally backfired and he got hurt or burned out, so be it, I think was his attitude. Of course, I don't want to speak for him, but that's sort of how it was interpreted by a lot of the community. And he's since aged and matured. And I think that um, his goals have changed and longevity mm -hmm. is a little bit more of a focus for him. Uh, for him. But um, talk a little bit more about that approach to the sport, like that all or nothing type strategy that you're taking. Do you do you feel like it's intelligent and or do you feel like there's um, have you experienced any sort of like negative consequences of taking that approach so far? I'd say the only negative consequences I've take I've I've had are um, uh, are uh, middle aged men on Twitter who have finished 100 miles in 24 hours and not 12 hours, 19 minutes offer me training advice. That's probably the only negative comp. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's probably the only thing is people who give me advice that I don't ask for. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's just like after my 12, 19 and my 11, 32, um, I just kind of see things as it's, it's here right now for me. I might as well go for it because um, every day I go to work, I get on, I get on the interstate and who knows, maybe a semi runs me off the road tomorrow morning or uh, uh, a year from now, I snap my Achilles tendon and I'm out for however long or uh, something tragic could happen. You just you just don't know. Um, I never imagined to be a distance runner, let alone at the, at the level I am now. I just consider every step I take on borrowed time and it's not my time. It's just uh, it's something that's been given to me and uh just like Steve Prefontaine said, anything, giving anything less than your best is wasting the gift. So I try to give my absolute best every day. Where do you think the self-confidence and that fire that you have inside you comes from? Uh, whew, probably just kind of the training. Um, you know, I, um, uh, distance running didn't come to me very easy at first. Like it did some people. I started when I was a uh, senior in high school, I was 17 years old when I started kind of running and all that. I didn't start running five days and 19 minutes when I was 12 years old, like some of my peers do, you know, I just, I just started late and, uh, I, I kind of learned how to train on my own. Um, I didn't have the best coaches in college. Uh, I just kind of adapted my own way to do stuff. And, uh, just because it works for me though, uh, that doesn't mean it'll work for everyone, I guess. But, but what about this fire? Like, what, what where do you think that's born from in your past or in your personality that gives you the desire to want to chase world records and to give you sort of the belief that you can do it and to sacrifice everything else in order to chase it right now um i'd say growing up i was um i was a i was a i was a decent athlete but i was six man all off the bench in basketball you know um I played baseball. It was either second base or right field. I wasn't first base. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't the starting shooting guard. Um, I just kind of had to earn everywhere I got. And then once I started running, once I got into the sport of cross country and track, it was, if you want to make state, if you want to win meets, you got to work harder. And I said, I just said, okay, nobody will ever work harder than me. And then um, I brought that mentality in triathlon where I was, I was honestly working out more hours per week in triathlon on what I am at home. Some weeks I was putting in 35 hours of volume of just swimming, cycling, running, and strength training. And then um, over, once I made the switch into ultra running over the past year, I've ran like 8,000 miles. And um, I completely understand I may not have the talent like a gym does or the VO2 max, but I'll never let anyone be more consistent than me. I'll never let anyone work harder than me. Uh, even if I do, let's say tomorrow I go out, I run and I pull my calf and I can't run for two months, three months. I'll still be waking up at 4 a.m. to strengthen that calf every day and doing core workouts and doing everything I can to, to make my return even better. I mean, just because you're injured doesn't mean you can't strengthen the muscle or strengthen other muscles in your body. I'll still be like 
that were to happen, I would still put in the same amount of volume that I do now. It wouldn't, it wouldn't just be me slacking off and just laying on the couch moaning about this injury. I love it, bro. I'm ready to run nice. through a brick wall. <laughs> inspiring me to work harder too. So back to the six days of the dome. So 1059 or bust. The record was 1119 at the time. So your goal was to run 20 minutes faster than Zach Bitter's world record, which he set at that same race. This is only six weeks removed from. So, so hang on, hang on. They, they, uh, the world record was 11, 14, 55. It was done by the guy over in Belgium. The oh, so, guy. so he had already broken the, the yeah. record. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought, I thought yeah. that came after. So yeah, that the record's 11, 14. Now it was 11, 19 held by mm -hmm. Zach Bitter. So you were trying to go 15 minutes faster than the existing mm -hmm. world record, but 20 minutes faster than Zach Bitter. Ultimately you pull out of the race at about hundred K. So this is your first taste of adversity in the sport of ultra running. What were what were your uh, learnings from that? Were you just a little bit too close to the treadmill hundred miler, or what do you attribute that disappointment to? So I think it was uh, three. I think it was three big points. Uh, the first point was it was close to the treadmill world record, uh, but at the same time, when you're 25, you're young, you're confident, you're fit. You know, I don't regret trying to do the double. Um, According to what I was seeing on paper with my training, I wasn't showing very much fatigue from the treadmill, but that doesn't mean deep down inside, I still didn't have cells that were recovering and muscle fibers that were coming back together. I think the fatigue was very deep down in that I couldn't see in the six weeks in between the two of those. Yeah, there was just something that I, I didn't expect to feel just because uh, just I it was probably the fatigue of the treadmill and the fatigue of the training also leading to the treadmill. You know, my body was recovering from both of those aspects. Uh, number two, uh, it's definitely something I never thought of. You know, the dome, it's 55 degrees and 20% humidity. It's perfect to run in, but that 20% humidity makes it dry in there. And um, I underestimated my hydration. Um, I was sipping like I do for a tunnel hill or a treadmill run. Cause I'm used to that higher humidity. And when I went into there, it just dried me out completely. Uh, that's something that I didn't think about. Nobody on my team thought about, um, you know, next year, if I return to the dome, I plan on going there to do long runs. I'm going to put a dehumidifier in my treadmill room. This will never happen again. I will never have to worry about dry conditions. So, so that was number two. And I would say number three was the inexperience of a track ultra where there's a lot of people and me going in and out of the crowds. Uh, you know, someone like Zach or uh, someone like Camille has done that quite a bit where they can really understand, you know, they can step only this far compared to I probably went an extra step farther than what they would have done outside. And uh, at first, I really enjoyed passing people all day. But then after about two hours, it made me feel uncomfortable. And uh, there were times where, you know, I would run by someone accidentally knock them or they would knock me and uh, just kind of that going in and out, in and out all day uh, was a lot tougher than what I thought it would be. So those were probably my three big takeaways from the film. Yeah, it reminds me. I mean, we keep bringing up Jim Walmsley, but it reminds me of when he won Western States, broke the course record for the first time and then went to UTMB only eight or nine weeks later. And in between, he did ridiculously huge training volume in Silverton, ultimately showed up at UTMB, totally burned out, dropped mm -hmm. out, I think, halfway through the race. And uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of overlaps between your two personalities and the type of approach that you take to the sport where you take big, big swings. But I think that's a really key learning for you is, you know, you probably could have not done a 260 mile week in between and probably yeah. showing up a little bit more fresh but again you're only 25 there's a lot to learn and um yeah no mm -hmm. doubt you've got many more opportunities ahead of you to to take another crack so it seems though that this was like a, you took this one personally like it's yeah like this it's it stung this hard. one cut deep it cut talk, deep into me talk about that a little bit well, well, uh, well, I think before that, I want to go back to the gym thing. Uh, when Jim ran the, you know, the second fast 100 K time in the world back in February, I was doing a long run while I was like watching this thing. 
And it was just firing me up. I was just increasing speed and my like 32 mile run ended up being like a 45 mile run. Cause I'm just like imagining myself like right next just to like this guy. Nobody's working harder than me. You can't yeah. allow Jim to work harder. He's <laughs> running a hundred K world record. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was just, it was just like crazy just to watch him. I just had it in front of my treadmill, just me and him. I just, that's, the, that's what I was thinking about all day anyway. So yeah, this, this one really, it, it cut deep into me. Uh, I'd never, I, I, I felt I've never been in a place in my life that was like so low after a race. And I just, I felt like that I was, I, I didn't know where to go after this. Um, I wasn't for sure what to do. I had, you know, I had so many amazing, probably a thousand people reach out to me afterwards. And I, I didn't know what to say. I was just heartbroken. Um, Thankfully, I walked away without an injury. Um, I, I left the race before I got injured, so I had that going for me. But um, it was it was a rough probably 10 days after that. But um, finally, I was able to dig myself out of the hole and come back to earth. And and I, let me tell you, it was a humbling. It was humbling coming back to earth after after that DNF. But so. I'm curious though, like wh why was it so painful for you? Did it, did it feel like you had failed? Like you had let people down or like, because you had called your shot so publicly, I'm going to run 1059. I'm going to shock the world. And you drop out at hundred K. Were you like a little bit embarrassed or what was it? Why did it hurt so bad? It was probably a combination of all those, you know, I had, um, I had so many people watching me. I had brought, you know, my crew up to Milwaukee, uh, Jamil and Steve Blythe came in to, uh, to, uh, do the whole thing and just to live stream it. And, and, you know, I had said that it was, it was 1059 or die trying and, and I only made it to 100 K. It's not like I made it to 90 miles and, and fell off. I, I, I hardly made it three fourths of the way I made it two thirds of the way of the race and I, and I dropped out. I mean, that's just extremely embarrassing and unacceptable. It, and then afterwards I, I was just, I, it was just a very tough place for me to Cause you kind even, of, you even uh, shaved 1059 into your hair. Yeah. 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 I shaved 1059 so into my left side and then I did the flash symbol on the right side. It was, <laughs> it, it was, I so mean, badass. just like I said, that. Thank you. Just like I said, it was 1059 or bust. And um, I busted at 62 or 63, 64 miles somewhere in there. Um, yeah. It just, it was just, it was just the whole buildup and my confidence every day was growing and growing. And I thought, I honestly thought I was going to run like 1055. Uh, and then just for it to all fall apart while I'm um, falling on the track as a dehydration and walking laps. And just, it was just heartbreaking for me too pull out and not finish the race yeah that's sports bro that's sports. it is it is huge huge highs that you enjoyed early mm -hmm. in your career and then yeah you got brought down to earth in a painful way and no doubt mm -hmm. it's going to make you a better athlete does calling your shot in such a way publicly does that increase you know your motivation does it help you uh, i think so performance wise talk about that a little bit yeah um yeah i i think it I think it definitely does. Uh, you know, before Tunnel Hill, nobody knew who I was. And I want to, and I told a few of my friends, yeah, I'm going to go for this quote American record. And they're like, oh, you probably shouldn't post about that. I'm like, it's not like anyone good knows about me. They're like, ah, don't do it. I said, okay, well, okay. And then um, going in the treadmill, I was like, yeah, I'm just going to make this public. You know, I kind of have to, to make it a bigger deal. And then uh, thankfully I ran the treadmill world record. And then two days after, I made it public. I was going to six days in the dome for just the hundred mile world record. And then finally it was two weeks after that. I said, um, everything I will ever want is on the other side. I'm on everything I'm willing to give at six days in the dome. I'm going to give everything for a sub 11 hour, 100 mile run. And that, that kind of brought a lot of eyes to it. And it just increased my uh my drive to train even harder like i was at the point where seeing 17 miles before work wasn't good enough and i was running 19 20 miles and then i was coming home and running a half marathon every day after school and, and thankfully at this point school was out so i had it was kind of a blessing and a curse if you give me all day to just run uh it's it's kind of the best and worst thing that'll ever happen to me you know i finally gotten my chance to 
to kind of live like a pro for a few weeks before my uh, dome attempt. And I said, I'm going to make the most of this. And I just had all day to eat, run, sleep. And that's kind of what I did into the dome. Uh, so that's, that's, that's how that went. So, you know, it's a, a big bummer for you, but grew the, grew the fire bigger and mm -hmm. your next competitive objective was the Badger Trail 100, which mm -hmm. unfortunately also went sideways. <laughs> Tell the, mm -hmm. tell the, tell the, uh, tell that story a little bit, and then we'll get to sort of how th you're changing things up in the wake of these two disappointments. So, uh, the Badger Trail 100, uh, I reached out to Scott at 10 Junk Mile. Scott's a great guy. We had never met or kind of really talked much and said, Hey, would you care if I came and ran your race? And he was so excited. You know, I, I had this fitness. Um, it's not like I made it to 90 miles with the dome and pulled out. I pulled out, I pulled out at 100 K. So um, I didn't completely leave everything. So I had a little bit of fitness and I said, you know what, since I'm not going to do this Ironman that I don't deserve to do, I said, I'm going to do this 100 and this hot, this hot um, Illinois, Wisconsin summer 100 and just kind of learn how to run in the heat and finish it and just not really kind of care about the time, just go out and just kind of run respectfully and uh, do my best with nutrition. And it started off the day as decently cool. It was probably mid sixties and it warmed right up. You know, the humidity came out and that's what, and uh, that's what I went there for is, you know, someday if I'm in Arizona or uh, if I'm running to Auburn someday in June, I need to learn how to run in the heat, yes. uh, uh, you know, in case, in case that ever, in case I decide to ever try something like that, I need to learn how to run when it's hot. Um, for the first time I was putting ice into a hat and putting it on top of my head. Uh, I was just, you know, just like I said, I, I was learning how to run an ultra when it's not ideal conditions. So I went there, uh, the race started, went underway. Uh, my crew was not there. My mom was there crewing for me and God bless her for doing that. But I, I don't think her and I will ever do that again. Just, just, it was just, it was just a lot on her and a lot on me. And I could tell after the first aid station, I was like, you just have to be patient with her for the rest of the day. So, uh, we get in there in the race. I'm feeling good. And then um, I hear this slight kind of like clicking or popping sound in my knee. And um, it doesn't bother me, but um, I don't I don't ever hear stuff like that when I run. You know, I'm training 200 miles a week. And I think, well, what is this? So uh, I was kind of in a low spot around like 60 miles. But then uh, from 60 to 70, I started running my fastest mileage of the day. I was running probably sub seven minute pace for that 10 mile split in there and i thought okay well here's my up and then i made my it was a double out and back so it was 33 miles one way or 33 and a half miles one way you go out come back and then you go out finish again and uh when i made the turn i was coming back from 70 and then i got to the 80th mile aid station and and my knee was still kind of making that sound but then at that point i said you know what I'm just going to put my headphones in. I don't care about this sound. I'm going to get through the next 20 miles or of this whatever. So uh, a few miles go by and I can really tell my gates kind of off at this point. And I came up to an aid station where uh, the local running group, the Central Illinois Trail Runners were uh, mandating. And I get to it and the, and the head lead guy uh, uh, told me that my gate was off and I said, it hurts. And uh, kind of my one thing with run training is I never run when it hurts. I never, I never run when it, when it's uh, sore or hurt or anything like that. I mean, I mean, I can run through fatigue and tired legs, but I don't run when it hurts. Mm -hmm. So I get to the 87 mile aid station and um, Mike, the a guy who's the aid station leader, he kind of fast walks with me and he said, well, um, how about we start jogging? I tried to jog. And at that point it was, it was hurting to jog. And uh, this guy, he has done several 100s. He's actually doing Leadville this weekend. And I kind of looked for him in that moment for advice. He said, you have two options. He said, you can you can basically walk, jog this thing out and, and still finish under 13 hours and uh, first place course record. And he said, you might cause some damage or we can turn around and call your ride to come get you. But he said, um, as soon as you turn backwards, he says, you're going to pull the plug because you don't walk backwards in an ultra. And I stood there for about a minute and I really thought about it and I looked at him and um, he just explained to me, you know, there are bigger things ahead of me than just winning that race. Uh, so I made another tough decision to pull out at 87 miles and do 100 miles, which was tough, but um, and nowhere near stung like the dome did. Yeah, it's a long training run, man. 
so a very a very long training run. <laughs> yeah. So again, you posted something to this effect, but you're two for two, two huge, mm-hmm. awesome accomplishments, and then two big disappointments. Mm-hmm. And now, based on the tweet that I read at the beginning of this show, you've learned some stuff, and you plan to implement those learnings and change a little mm-hmm. bit about your approach. What are those things that you've learned, and how do you plan to change? So um, when I first started ultra marathon this time last year, when I was training for tunnel Hill, I felt like um, I needed all the aerobic volume as possible that, you know, I was this young guy trying to get into the sport where these guys in thirties plus kind of, you know, uh, just rule everything. And it makes sense. And I felt like because of my triathlon training for years, I had hardly ran any mileage at all. I was running like 20 miles a week, for like three years of my life, which isn't, isn't a lot for a fast runner by all means. So in the past year, I've made up for all that mileage. You know, I ran, like I said, 8,000 miles. I'm at the point to where, um, I can scale back my training a little bit. Um, why, when I say scaling back, I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to not put in any weeks over one, 190, 200 miles. I mean, I'm still going to be running that 150, 170 range. Um, but for the first time since probably the end of 2019, start 2020, I'm adding intensity back into my running. Um, I'm trying like on a Wednesday to get in kind of like a fart, like, like 30, 40 minutes of work. And then on a Saturday or Sunday, just kind of doing like a longer tempo effort with less miles, but I'm running a lot faster. So I'm doing my best to do those two things on top of uh, substituting miles for like kind of like core strength and just body strength workouts after the run. So just uh, to understand that I'm doing some work, I'm just not physically running. And I think between Tunnel Hill and the treadmill and these past two runs, it shows that I'm at a point to where I can do this now when a year, when like a year ago, I felt like I did, I, like I, like I had to just put out all the volume as possible. I mean, I'm still doing extremely high volume for 99% of people, but um, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to do my best to hold back for the first time. Well, I mean, hold back is one way to put it, but you're just sort of placing your effort mm-hmm. in a different you're emphasizing a different stimulus and i think Mm -hmm. you're very wise to take this approach after putting eight thousand miles in in a year you know for context i've never run over 3500 miles in a year so the fact that you've done eight thousand that's more than double my biggest volume for a 360 uh 365 day span which is just ridiculous volume and definitely not sustainable. And I know longevity and sustainability is not your number one mm-hmm. priority, but it is, it does show maturity at a young mm-hmm. age, early in your career to take these two quote unquote failures or disappointments and not keep banging your head against the wall, not take what worked the first two races and try and just continue to keep doing the same thing, the same thing, the same thing, but instead to, yeah, have the humility and have this, the discipline to reimagine how you could approach things to take a little bit more of a, um, yeah, like a creative view to how to get the most out of your body. And I think for sure, adding some more intentional intensity in while lowering the volume you're going to be surprised i think this is going to really really help you and i have pity on those who step through the start line with you (laughs) here coming up in the future and uh definitely want to start talking a little bit about your future now you alluded to the fact that you might start experimenting in in more trail racing tell me about how you thought about that and how you might envision trail running and mountain running fitting into your future so um, I got some stuff in the flats before I want to go over to the trails. Um, I've got the 100 mile world record and um, I got that. And I want to go after Giannis Koros's 24 hour world record before I commit to something like the trails. Um, I'm going to go to Hennepin and run the 50 here in a couple of weeks and then to Tunnel Hill to run a 100 and then Desert Solstice for my first attempt at 24 hours. Um, I think the, I think the trail and the whole, uh, probably push for, um, like a Western States would be after the 2024 U S Olympic marathon trials, um, getting an OTQ and running there. 
is something that's like a life long thing I need to do. Um, but I think once I do it once, I don't have any really need or kind of fulfillment to go back if that makes sense. And to get to like a Western States, you know, you gotta have, you know, Jim has leg speed. You gotta be able to hang with Jim. Um, I got to prove to myself, I can run like a two fifteen marathon or something like that in a few years to, in order to get the confidence to go to a black Canyon or go to the Canyons 100 K to line up for a golden ticket or, uh, like a Havelina to get yeah, a golden I was ticket. Say, yeah. What about a Havelina? That's the type <laughs> of course that you could do really well on. And it would be a good next step for you from just like the dead flat courses or the track or the treadmill, right? It's so manicured trail and has mm -hmm. a little bit of undulation, but mm -hmm. I think it's a course that you, I mean, you could certainly compete to win against guys who do more training on trails. You know, um, I thought about Havelina, but um, I hate to say this, but uh, I can get a pretty financially good payday if I run well at Tunnel Hill this year. And um, I can't let someone come into my backyard and take that from me. So I got to go back to Tunnel Hill. I owe it to the race to Steve Durbin and it's just where everything started. Um, so I, I got to go back there this year before I even think about trying to go for a golden ticket and finish and finish that off. And the goal at Tunnel Hill is to go sub 12 this time? Um, I'm not for sure what the goal is yet. You know, I'm going to have Desert Solstice right after it. Uh, it just depends on the weather. Uh, last year when I ran Tunnel Hill, it was 45, 50 degrees all day. When Zach ran it, it was like below freezing all day. So uh, it'll just depend on the course itself and it's kind of the weather that day, a lot of it. And before that, you're going to do the Hennepin 50. Is that simply just a, like a training race to lead into Tunnel Hill? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to try to throw down a decent, decently quick 50 mile time. I'm not for sure if it'll be 100% all out, but it's going to be probably something pretty fast that day. Mm -hmm. Awesome, man. Well, the, the, the desert solstice race, I think, will be a really fun race to see you at mm -hmm. because, you know, obviously to this point in your career, basically everything you've done has been kind of like a personal time trial, right? Mm -hmm. Like your first tunnel Hill, it's not like anybody was chasing you. You're going after Zach Bitter's record there, mm -hmm. the treadmill world record, obviously that was a personal time trial. These other races that you've done, it's not like anybody's mm -hmm. pushing you. And usually mm -hmm. desert solstice, there's a handful of people who are actually like mm -hmm. racing. And what, what are your goals there at, at the 24 hour race at, desert solstice is this going to be your first crack at Giannis Kouros's time or do you think it's going to be more of a 100 mile race rather than a 24 hour race oh this is this is me going after 189 miles I mean uh Giannis Kouros's 24 hour world record is is the hardest record in ultra marathon it's the one that takes the most grit um I don't know why more people aren't going after it um my plan is to split split the first 100 miles in 12 hours and then I've got 12 hours to go 89 miles. I got to figure a way out to get, to get from basically from the middle to the end. Um, I'm going to run seven twelves for the first 100, change shoes, change socks, shorts, eat a sandwich and go back out for 89 miles and uh, just do my best. I mean, I'm not going to be upset if I come up short uh, and Giannis's first 24 hour attempt, he went 177 miles. So I try not to compare myself to others, but that's kind of what I'm measuring it to. Um, if I land at 180, I'm going to be kind of freaking out because I'll be so excited over that. Um, if I somehow manage to pull off the overall 24 hour world record, um, I think I could probably retire from running and be completely fine with myself. Uh, so uh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm definitely intimidated by the record by all means. It, it scares me more than the 100 mile or the 100 K world record. It's just, in, it's just insane that that time and number is. Well, dude, I can't wait to watch. Obviously that's a Aravipa race and I'm sure they're going to have the live stream going at desert mm -hmm. solstice. And I think uh, with your attitude, with the fact that you like to call your shots, there's going to be a lot of eyeballs watching you there. So thanks. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. You'll have to take take the learnings from the six days in the mm -hmm. dome and, and the Badger Trail. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, respect the distance, respect the legend of Giannis Koros. But yeah, mm -hmm. man, take a swing. Can't wait to yeah. watch. Yeah. I can't wait for it to be 4 a.m. and I'm 160 miles deep and I got four hours to go or something like that. I just cannot <laughs> wait. 
for that. And like, I can't wait for that moment in there because, cause I have a feeling that it's gonna, it's gonna start to really sting and burn around like that 130, 140 mark when it's around midnight, one, two, but then once it reaches that time in between like the sun setting and the sun rising and there's just nothing going on the track, like that, that is when the world record is either gonna happen or it's not yeah. in that time.